Um, I really appreciate chances to do things like this over two days. Uh, it's really great when there's a chance to, 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 to be exposed to something, talk about it, maybe sleep on it, come back a second day. I think it often is something we can absorb things a lot better. So with that, um, I'm curious how much, you know, are there complaints, provisos, additions, some things you'd like to say, uh, you know, anything that came out of your groups yesterday before we get started again that you think would be, you know, good to clarify before we move on? I was expecting much more criticism. <laughs> We're in Croatia. Well, you, said, you said it took you three years to process that, so we're all... Oh, okay. I probably shouldn't have said that. That was probably a mistake. Yeah, that was probably a mistake. Okay. Ask us three years. Ask us three All right. Well, okay. So today we're going to try and look at this more in context. Uh, we're going to try and move between the first century to understand a little bit better why this has even become such, like a theological discussion amongst, I mean, amongst theologians. Go through the medieval church because that's a crucial moment in uh, church history, and then to today. Um, wanted to share a little bit more about. Uh, I mean, just to kind of close off some things we we addressed yesterday. Um, again, in Barclay's presentation, which convinced me pretty well, there's this idea that this incongruity is a really key perfection for Paul's preaching of the gospel. So kind of getting that in our minds and our heads and understanding what that means is um, uh, crucial for preaching the gospel in the same way that, that Paul himself did. Um, <clears throat> and that then, so when we are trying to explain the grace of God to other people, maybe not using the word incongruity, but although I, I think like, I remember when I preached on this in church the first time, Vienci really liked the word uh, ne primier nost, and so that's, that, that is more maybe a, a word you can use without scaring people in Croatian. Maybe incongruity in English is a little bit of a big word. Um, so, so in Croatian, ne primeremos, when you hear it first without the explanation, means this is like indecent. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Improper. 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 Yeah. It has completely negative connotations in a shameful... Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah. And so that's an interesting question. When you talk to people, do you want to, or when do you want to talk about the shame, shame almost the shamelessness of this? Like, and, and I think there is an aspect of this. And you see, that's what Paul has to answer. That's, that is one of the kind of Chuck Swindoll things from back in the day. It was like, he would talk about that. And he would say, you're not really preaching grace until your person you are talking to accuses you of giving a license to sin. And then you know you're really preaching grace. And you go, no, 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 that's not my intention. But it's good that you are worried that's my intention. Because if you, you're not hearing it until you're worried that that's what I'm telling you. I think that's an interesting kind of <coughs> dynamic. But this gets to the scandal part. I think this, this uh, quote from Barclay right here, it was normal that gifts, especially rare significant gifts, should be distribu distributed with discrimination <clears throat> and were good gifts only if so distributed. An unmerited gift from God was theologically problematic and could threaten the justice and the rationality of the universe. Although Christian theologians and modern dictionaries regard it today as self-evident that grace means a benefit to the unworthy, in ancient times, it was a striking and theologically dangerous construal of the concept. So when Paul preached his gospel, people were like, that threatens God's justice, the structure of the universe, everything that's right in the world. How dare you? That's how people responded to him. And I think that you see him wrestling with his assumed uh, opponents in a lot of his letters, and especially in Romans, he's, he's jumping ahead to try and anticipate people's arguments that, is, the is God still just? That is the question that, that is left when Paul says, hey, Jesus died, was crucified, rose again for our sins. That seems to threaten God's justice because God had always promised that he was going to be faithful to his, his, to his Jewish people to save them through time, to justify them for their obedience and loyalty to the law. And then he did this other thing in Christ, and that threatens all the all that is right in the world, kind of a thing. So, um, this is a question that kind of comes to me. So, one of the big questions you will, we will probably also be hearing is is to or uh, you run into is that you know we in a lot of our materials, a lot of what we do, we'll talk a lot about the epistles. We will we will use Paul's letters a lot, 
And you'll run into people, especially if they're from a more traditional religious background, who will say, but I like the red letters. You know, I like what Jesus said. I like the Gospels. And sort of how is Paul's gospel really connected to the Gospels? And there's, there's been some theological movements that have said that Paul's gospel is quite different from the Gospels. And this has become controversial in places like America, where people say, well, I want to be a red letter Christian. I don't care so much about the, new, the rest of the New Testament, stuff like that. <clears throat> I think that incongruity helps us understand why Paul was so um, confident in his gospel message. Because the thing that really ties it all together is that when you look at the cross, what happens is that all systems of value fail at the cross. Nobody was on Jesus' side. The government, the religious people, men, women, children, the young, the, like nobody was on his side. So, well, there's, yeah, okay. So there's, there is this question of, the, so Paul, I think the, what gave Paul the impetus to keep going with his message, no matter how radical and how much it upset people was, but remember the cross, like remember what was going on at the cross. Everybody failed at the cross. Jesus was completely alone. This did not work according to anyone's real set of expectations about how this was supposed to happen. So I think Paul was absolutely convinced of the, of the incongruity of the cross and then his own life too, which is like, how in the world did it end up that I, as the most dedicated kind of Jew possible, was killing Christians for proclaiming the gospel. Like I ended up an enemy of God. How did I get it so wrong? And that's what drove him. And then I think that also, you know, for us then is a, a good reminder of kind of, you know, where, where the energy for that comes from. So I think, that's what, I think that's what connects the gospels to Paul's gospel. All right, uh, another one. Um, uh, as we talk about how we, how we explain, you know, what is grace. Uh, and uh, have you ever had the person who says to you, oh, so you say it's all about faith. So faith is actually like its own work because you have to believe in Christ and that's the work that you do in order to be saved. That's, that's your righteousness. Um, and I think we, we use similar explanations to this, but I really like this one. So when you look at the Galatians um, famous verses that, you know, are really good to memorize. I've been crucified with Christ is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life that I live by the and by faith in the Son of God who loved him and gave himself up for me. There's a song. Do you guys remember the song? <coughs> da, da, da. Anyway, so. Um, uh, and this is the way Barclay summarizes this. He says, faith is not an alternative human achievement nor a refined human spirituality, but a declaration of bankruptcy. A radical and shattering recognition that the only capital the only kind of recognition of worth in God's economy is the gift of Christ, crucified and risen. Faith directed to and centered on Christ recognizes under the impact of the good news that there is no element of value locatable in the human being. It invests everything in the only capital that counts, which is Christ. I think that's a pretty good summary. And I think we try to, claim, we try to preach the gospel in that way. That we're saying like faith isn't like the thing God is finally accepting, expecting you to do. Faith is, this, is the declaration of bankruptcy, which makes me want to make that joke from the office, but probably not a lot of people. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> well, Michael, Michael doesn't understand bankruptcy, so one time he walks into the office and he goes, I declare bankruptcy, and he doesn't understand that that's not how it works. All right, so now we're going to talk about kind of um, how this has worked through the, the history of theology. This is Luther's classic Reformation view, and uh, Barclay's very influenced by Luther, and I think that Barclay convinced me to be a lot more appreciative of Luther than I have been in the past. Um, th so this classical view is that God declares us righteous not on the basis of anything we have done. It can't be merited, it comes through faith alone. So Calvin agreed with this, this became the really firm Protestant consensus through history. Now, in the last 40 years, the hottest probably topic in uh, studies of Paul has been something called the new perspective on Paul, which um, uh, starts, I think, fundamentally with this question. Was the typical first century Jew really full of religious pride, a person who legalistically saw his obedience to the law as making himself righteous before God? Because that's who Luther saw in 
the, Paul's opponents in Galatia. And so Luther applied that to medieval Catholicism and then was able to make his kind of pro proclamation of the gospel. He staked it all on Paul's understanding in Galatians and in Romans. But was a first century Jew really that way? Paul, Luther had every right to say medieval Catholics were that way because he was not only a medieval Catholic, he had been a uh, he, he was a priest, he was a brother, he was a theology professor, and so he was speaking out of his own experience about how he felt like he had kind of, his brain had operated as a medieval Catholic. So he said, oh, I find the same thing in Galatians, so Paul is preaching against the same kind of thing the medieval Catholic Church is doing, so therefore, this is my gospel, kind of also <laughs> recovered from Galatians. But the question became, in this the, in theological circles over the last 40 years is, is that really the way first century Jews felt? The, the book that kicked this all off is called um, Paul and Palestinian Judaism, written by E.P. Sanders in the 70s, late 70s. And this guy, supposedly, this, this guy is like an undisputed expert. He has read everything you know, in Syriac and Hebrew and Greek or whatever that was written around this period um, and knows it all in and out. Um, and his main idea, which he says is that Jews were not legalistic. They believed in grace. Uh, and so he just, his view of the first century, the way he describes the way Jews thought in the first century was he called it covenantal gnomism. Who has heard this term before from Michael Brent? Who remembers Michael Brent oh, using yeah. this term? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, this, Michael really, Mike, this is, I'm channeling Michael Brent in some places in here. Um, and Sanders would say that the, the gospel is basically telling people the law has been set aside simply because Jesus uh, has now come as the way to salvation. There's not so much like opposition between the law and the gospel. It's that the, the law was the old thing and then the new thing has come, which is the gospel. And now we're moving on. This is a summary of what his view of covenantal nomism is. So again, he's saying a first century Jew was not a legalistically self-righteous person. A first century Jew actually thought this way, okay? So this is, this is how he summarizes this. But this one, I think, like, listen as I read this. Does this sound familiar? Okay. His, this is how, this is Sanders saying, no, 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 you've misunderstood first century Judaism. This is how they thought about things. God graciously chose Israel, gave them the law, and promised to be faithful to his choice. He chose Israel before they did anything. So the people are required to obey. And God rewards obedience. He punishes sin. The law makes place for atonement and the removal of sin. So in this way, the covenantal relationship can be maintained. And those who maintain their position inside the covenant through obedience and sacrifice will be saved in the end. Election and salvation are by God's mercy, not by human achievement. Does this ring any bells for you or does... This sound, what does it sound like? What were you going to say? Yeah, th I mean, this sounds like the, av the normal lived experience of, of a somewhat religious Roman Catholic person today. And it sounds like the normal religious experience of how I grew up as a mainline Protestant in the United States in the 1980s. And it sounds like the way a lot of, a lot of good religious people all over the world think about stuff. Like there's some sort of initial grace from God that's given that kind of made us into a community and kind of we mess up and maybe he, he punishes us, but there's these like mechanisms by which you kind of fix things and you're, you're, you're trying to stay inside of the, the boundaries of what's acceptable and you're kind of trusting that in the end everything's gonna work out, right? That, that, doesn't that sound like how we often just live our lives as if we're somewhat good religious people. Any comments or thoughts on that? Everything makes sense in the Roman Catholic way of thinking except the last one. The last one, election, salvation. Uh-huh, really? Okay, cool, cool. This is more of kind of the Pentecostal. And you think Pentecostals are all this kind of too, yeah. I, I, I mean, That's it true. is, it's like you have to have the fear of wow. you can lose your salvation to keep you in. Wow, yeah. I would say this is all Croatian Protestants. Okay, I would say this is all. The vast majority of them. We just don't pretend we got one speaker, you know, and people just said, like, exactly what he said. He said, like, he knew all of these. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, all right. Good, good, okay, so I'm glad. Yeah, I, that's what I think, and Michael's the person who, no, I mean, sorry. Michael's the person, I don't know if you guys have heard him do that, but he's the one who helped me understand, like, because this, like, oh, well, E.P. Sanders says that first century Jews didn't feel at all like that. They had this very different way of thinking. It was like this. And then Michael said, that sounds exactly like the way everybody I've ever met in Croatia thinks. So it's not like some historical thing. It's still, it's more, it's, it's actually quite universal. Um, so the response to this would be, um, and uh, drawing in this is what Barclay wrote, also another book I have, a uh, um, really interesting book called Where is Boasting by a, a um, professor in England named Simon Gathercole. And so there's these questions, which is a response to the new perspective, which is to say, did Palestinian Judaism really not have any of the kind of legalistic tendencies that Luther claimed uh, that he also saw in the medieval Catholic Church? Is there really no such thing as legalistic, self-righteous pride mixed up in all of this? Um, does the New Testament really not preach against legalistic self-righteousness? That's, that's the claim of kind of the hardcore new, new perspective on Paul, is that the New Testament is never fighting against self-righteousness. Um, and if there's no legalism, why does Paul set the gospel against boasting so often? Boasting is a term that shows up a lot. Um, where is boasting then? About I, I boast in something, or there's no boasting, you know kind of questions. So why is boasting kind of a, a thing that Paul puts in opposition to, to his own perspective? So here's, just, here's just one quote. Did Palestinian Judaism, again, documents that we have from the Jewish community around the first century, is there really no such thing as boasting in it? Well, this is a book called Jubilees, which is not even in the Apocrypha. It's called Deuterocanonical. And here's a quote. I will do everything just as you have commanded me, because this thing is an honor and a greatness for me and a righteousness for me before the Lord that I should honor him. That kind of sounds self-righteous and legalistic. <laughs> you know, on first, you know, on first, so Aunt Sanders says, you'll never find anything like this. And then people like Gathercole went and, you know, dug up and said, no, actually, you know, these kind of statements sound like the kind of thing Martin Luther would have been really angry about in, in his arguments uh, in the medieval church. Does the New Testament really not criticize legalism? Well, go in the Gospels, this parable is kind of devastating because it's the, Pharise the Pharisee and the tax collector go up to the temple and the Pharisee says, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, right? I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything that I have. And, and then the tax collector just beats his breast and says, have mercy on for me. I know I'm a sinner. And then who walks away justified? The tax collector. So again, that statement sounds an awful like somebody who has a, pro a problem with religious pride and thinking that they are righteous because of their deeds. So that, that is but there. talking to the Pharisees, not to the average Jew, which is a big problem. So that, that, that's another, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, the, what, what you're seeing is that it's complicated. It's a very, there's, a, there's all sorts of people. And I think that's what we find in our evangelism all the time too. You run into somebody who is like, full-blown like this every once in a while, and you run into tons of people who are more like the covenantal gnomism, I'm just trying to kind of stay inside of the bounds and hoping God will have mercy on me in the end kind of thing. But it's all there. And what happens, I think that Croatia, well, side truck would be like, I think that Kroats could do an incredible job contributing to the discussion on this new perspective on Paul thing, because what most of the scholars who do it do is they totalize their views and they say, no, 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 no. All Jews thought this way, or this was how Jews looked at things. And we live in a, yeah, we live in a kind of religiously fervent culture, but we know how many different ways people live this out, right? We know what a variety there is in every human heart. And, and that somebody might be really legalistic one year and then stop being and kind of be more covenantal gnomism a while later because they kind of had enough of it or something. Even like in a, inside a Roman Catholic church where there are many orders who yes. are like a lot more like legalistic or you know, very strict and there are those that are a lot more lenient. And so, yes. And like even a lay movement like the neo and others. So it's, yes. it's really interesting. There's a, like a great variety. Uh, the, 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 Catholics, you know, yeah. Also. Yeah. 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 It, it seems to me. Actually, I think it seems like everybody goes towards legalism, but then you give up. Like, yeah. You, know, <laughs> you, you can't do it. Yeah. Like I can't be a Pharisee, or I can't do this well enough. So then I have to come do the second best, and then this whole works 
That's that's a so, great quote. Everybody goes to the Lord's legalism and then gives up. That's yeah. That's because we want to justify ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Great. 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 Okay. What happens in Protestant circles? Yeah. Yeah. And and this happens in all religious communities. All Catholics, but it's like they have it too. Yeah. And then so the last one, just you know, if there's no legalism, what is this boasting thing that Paul opposes so strongly, saying things like? If you call yourself a Jew, you rely on the law and you boast of your relationship with God. Uh, uh, you who boast in the law dishonor God by transgressing the law. There's other quotes there. I don't think I need to read them all. But this, you know, it's kind of like, what, what is Paul opposing with boasting? You know, who is he? He's basically saying people have a boastful sense of their own uh, status before God and their achievements. And so why is he opposing that if that's actually not the way people thought? So I think that just bringing up the new perspective on Paul helps us to kind of get a little bit closer into um, where the discussion is. Um, so, and then this is, I think one of the main reasons this book was written was to make this big point, which is that, and Barclay, I think, has seemingly has done a pretty devastating job in his reply. What he tell his kind of answer to Sanders is he says, E.P. Sanders, you are right that grace is everywhere in Palestinian Judaism. However, the grace that E.P. Sanders finds is prior grace. God's uh, choice comes before the demands of the Torah, right? God chose Israel as his people before they had the law. That's grace. It's not about getting in, but remaining in. You've probably heard that, that idea in theological circles if you're into that. Obedience is required. Is, obedience isn't, is not actually required, just the intention to be obedient. Um, so Sanders notices that Jews thought that this grace was, was actually congruous, he, that, that, San, that Jews actually thought, God chose us before we did anything, but he made a good choice. Yeah. He made a good choice of us as a people. We hadn't done anything yet. Hallelujah, God is very, very gracious, but he was wise in choosing us. Do you see this? So this is the difference between priority and incongruity, right? Like, and so someone may say, I believe all in grace. We did nothing before God shows us. It's all God's grace. But then you say, well, yeah, but did, was God's choice of you fitting in some way? And you're like, yes. <laughs> you know, so this is the whole point of the book is to try and help us tease out these different ways that people, what different things people mean when they talk about grace. Um, so, uh, yeah, that Sanders missed that priority does not, is not the same thing as incongruity. All right. So Luther, so then I think we can go back to Luther and look at him again. There are definitely things that Luther thought and looked at where he missed the first century. I, I read an interesting article recently saying, what would Luther think if he could have read the Dead Sea Scrolls? Because he just didn't have access to so much of the stuff that we can read today that tells us how they thought in the first century. So this would be a summary that, that Luther actually made a brilliant contextual move as a theologian applying the first century situation to the medieval church um, and saw a similar pattern of denial of the incongruous grace of God as Paul attacked um, among Judaizers in Galatia. And this is one of my favorite statements from Luther is that Luther says the love of God does not find but produces that which is pleasing to it. That's from one of his disputations. I think that's a wonderful kind of statement of what the uh, incongruous grace really is. The love of God doesn't find anything in us that is lovable. It, it makes something lovable that then it gives to us. He gives to us, but it still remains God's. We don't become worthy by that. It's just that God has chosen to make something lovable, um, uh, to create it in us. What, what, like, what do you think he's referring to? Because like, when I look at this, like, I would imagine, imagine you are the creator, and then you know, your, the children you created like, run away from you. Wouldn't there be at least the trace of love towards your created work, which has like, intrinsic, in, intrinsic value yeah, 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 in yeah. it? Yeah. Like, you know, you as a creator love what you've created and that has gone away from you. So, yeah, yeah. So, so when Luther says nothing, does he really, does he just mean uh, like what we display out towards God? Or does he mean us in and of ourselves as well are not lovable? That's a good question. I think there, put, there, there are times when he's, because of what he's trying to do, he's going to emphasize it like we're just worms, we're terrible, in a way that 
maybe, and so that's where you can tease through his theology and say, like, yeah. is that really what we want to say? Because he lived in a, in a very different era than we do. But I think that... But that's a total depravity thing. Yeah, and yeah. I've always wondered about this because, uh, you know, we are, you know, God's workmanship created, right. you know. Uh, right. So, uh, so I... Uh, but that's yeah. like two it's different yeah, like uh, value is yeah. intrinsic and nobody can, I don't know if you understand me. Yes, 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 <laughs> nobody, yes. nobody can take it away from you. But Paul himself says there is nothing good in me. Yeah, yeah, so I think... The way how we reflect God's uh, character and we fail. Yeah, yeah, so I think it's that the, the image of God is marred in us, but it's still there. But God so loved the world that he gave his only son to, you know, so that anyone who believes in it would be saved. But it means that there's nothing, especially in one person as opposed to another person, that makes it like more fitting that that person receives the grace of God than another person. Because again, the shocker is, I mean, the, the formative experience of the early church, especially in Paul's churches, was going around preaching the gospel and seeing people who had zero religious credibility coming to Christ instead of those who should have. And then experiencing the power of the spirit, because he's always relying on these, always saying like how in Galatia, he's like relying on this. He said, did you start with the law or did you start with the spirit? What convinced you that God is real amongst you? You experienced the spirit of God and he formed this new community. And that that's this shocking, crazy experience of Paul's churches is that you could be a slave who, who's a complete pagan and never cared anything about the laws or the ways of God. And somebody shares the gospel with you somehow and this thing hits you and then you join the church and you, you become a prophet or you speak in tongues. Or so there's some demonstration that you are filled with the spirit and now you're a full-blown member of this church with zero religious credibility. How is that possible, right? So it's the shocking nature of the grace of God that, that lands on people without any regard to anything fitting in them. And so, yeah, we do have to kind of, with Luther, go like, eh, yeah, yeah. But I, I like this. I mean, personally, I really like this statement that the love of God did not find anything in me that was, um, but created something pleasing in me. Yeah. So uh, I'm not even going down that route that <laughs> some people are uh, more acceptable or pleasing because of something they've accomplished already. But why did God choose? some people and not others. Was it something in their nature that he knew? You know, it, it, it is a complicated. Right. It's not that simple, you know, there's nothing in us. There is, but we don't know what. And definitely I cannot say for someone, I don't know, I don't think that God will choose him because there is something in people that God, so there's, yeah, this is um, the, if you really want your, to prove your theological model does something, you have to deal with Romans 9 through 11, because it's like one of the <laughs> worst parts of the whole Bible, All right? So, and, and Barclay, I think, does a pretty good job of tracing through this, and, and his answer, which he acknowledges is scary, is this, he just basically says, we never know. We never, we have zero access to understanding on what basis God is choosing things. And so the Jacob I love and Esau I hated is just a remark saying not, not is just saying like, we just don't get it. Like we, it's beyond us to understand how this happens, but it's, but, but we're always tempted to want to explain it, to make sense of it and then go, Oh, see, God actually likes these kinds of people. This is not a thing that actually helps us in our evangelism. Yes. Otherwise I think, I mean, we're just going toward those who are you know, yes. pleasing and nice and beautiful and all that stuff. Or, or, Choose yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> great, great, great. Okay, um, uh, this is one can of I, a. Can I just add a go ahead. From yeah. this, uh, because, like, uh, I, I was involved in this new perspective of yeah, 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 thing, yeah. And, and there's been some like backlash because one of the popular theologians that he writes was a kind of yeah. uh, attack on, 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 uh, on uh, kind of parts of this. I, just, um, before you say it, let me just say that like yeah. Sanders is the, that's the, like the beginning of the whole thing. And the new perspective has gone in many, many different directions. That's, so that's yeah. not, this is not saying like, but. It's just the beginning, it went different ways. Yeah, but it's important to acknowledge where it began. That is that that's that's the the layer that under it kicks it kicked off all this thought about oh maybe we can rethink a lot of things and so yeah NT that's why I didn't even bring up NT right yeah yeah, yeah so thank you for that but just because you uh, because we're a serious you know uh, Christian organization and as you talk to other people you're going to hear about this 
one of the things that kind of broke my heart is I, I, I on the internet I was uh, communicating with my favorite like Christian author like uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Edwards uh, and I mentioned something about Wright and he just outright dismissed it he's like I'm not into that new perspective on Paul and so Wright says that uh, like uh, because uh, like, because anti Wright like kind of you know goes against the grain of America and Americans don't like him not all of them but you know. For instance, that guy from the Biblical Institute that has a library that came, he loves him and he brings him in. To, but but uh, this is what he says. Uh, uh, Anti Wright, uh, distancing himself from, from both Sanders, who started it all, and James Dunn is another big name. Mm -hmm. And the movement commented that there are probably almost as many new perspective positions as there are writers espousing it. <laughs> and I disagree with most of them. So yeah. just so for yeah. you to know, this is a complex new thought that's trying to analyze like what it was like for how do we understand the text because the context is the first century mm -hmm. Judaism and not a Lutheran uh, uh, interpretation of the old to medieval times. And even though we disagree with, with, with Sanders, please know that those are all serious, oh, serious yeah. scholars oh, yeah. who know way more than we do, who are trying their best to interpret the time. So just... Like just you know, I want us as an organization in general to have respect, just like we have respect towards the Catholic Church, even though we don't agree with everything they're teaching. Just like you know, just just know that it's not like some heretics trying to you mm -hmm. know they're they're trying to rest. just just so we sure know thank that. yeah okay so uh, this is also because I think because. <laughs> one of the things I realized, like, Romans 9 11 is so hard, we don't read it a whole lot. And then there's, like, a lot of really important stuff in there that we kind of, like, skip over. So I think this is one of the most devastating statements in the New so Testament. The yeah. yeah. About, <laughs> about how spiritually broken you can be in religious zeal. Like, listen, this, is, this is really heavy. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God but their zeal is not based on knowledge. He's saying this about the very people of God who have God's law. Their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. What is he, in, in, other, in narrative form, what does that mean? What does it mean that the Jews did not submit to God's righteousness? They sought to justify themselves. They rejected, they rejected, yeah, I, I think what he's referring to is the rejection of Christ. He's saying like, that, that, that's what's always forming his, his thought is the going back to the cross, going back to Jesus' ministry. This is his summary of like what is happening. You know, they, they, they sought to establish their own righteousness, so they didn't submit to God's righteousness, which is in Christ. God's righteousness is revealed in Christ, mm -hmm. and they didn't submit to it. Yeah, the next verse <clears throat> <laughs> uh, yeah, Christ is the culmination. Yeah, thank you. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Right. So, again, but I think this is a shockingly clear statement in the New Testament about um, uh, how religious, how spiritually broken a religiously zealous person is until they leave their spiritual capital behind to submit to righteousness from Christ. Um, and I think the challenge of Christ for, for Jews and Catholics and Baptists, you know, for all of us, is that he requires the recognition that God pays no regard for your pre-existing capital. Like, pre-existing capital or like, for all your good works, for all the, for the fact that your grandfather was the first Baptist in Daravar, for the fact that your, your, you know, your grandmother suffered terribly under Yugoslavia to, to keep going to the church every single Saturday. I mean, these are amazing things that people have done for their religious heritage. And, and that doesn't mean that we are want to like um, despise them. We want to pay, be really, really respectful. I'm amazed sometimes by stories I hear from, from Catholics of what it was like in Herzegovina in the early days of Yugoslavia. It was not easy <laughs> for them, right? Uh, and, and I want to not disrespect that. But the shocking thing is, and the, the really crazy thing we are doing, I mean, I think the deeper you go into this stuff, it just reminds you, we are doing really crazy things when we preach the gospel. We are preaching a revolution that is quite destabilizing in a lot of ways for people. It is really kind of nuts what we're doing because all the religious systems, they've kept society together for generations. They're not stupid. They're not like they, they deserve a lot of respect in a certain way, right? But the crazy thing is that because all those systems failed Jesus at the cross, they all still need to be submit to God's righteousness as revealed in Christ, 
which is radically different than how they have understood themselves. And this, I mean, it just kind of reinforces to me, like, wow, like preaching the gospel is a really dangerous, powerful, kind of a crazy thing, because it's so disjunctive from what anyone expected. Um, oh, and the, uh, you see really quickly then showing up in the New Testament itself that, that Gentile converts also could come to start boasting in themselves and start thinking of themselves. Basically, like this is the logic in, you know, you probably know this image, Romans 11, what he's, he, he explains what has happened as a, 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 a um, what kind of tree is it? It's a olive tree that has a base and the base is like the, it's, it's God, it's Israel, it's the old covenant. There's a lot of arguments about that. But then, so the Jews are, that what's happened is that a number of branches have been broken off because they refuse now to obey Christ and new branches have now been grafted in. And we, we Gentile believers are all wild olive branches that have just been grafted into a vine. But he has to anticipate something. He says, so if some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. So he's acknowledging that like not having any spiritual capital can be itself a source of saying, aha, I got in by doing nothing. So I'm better than you, you know, so that how fast this comes back, right? He's already, he's already dealing with this. And then in verse 20, you know, 20, 21, he says, so do not be arrogant, but tremble for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Um, all that just to say that uh, uh, all boasting is excluded, including Gentile boasting. Israel is still special, but is no longer unique. Um, and I think that helps us start to see, wow, this is a tendency throughout all of Christian history that, you know, you go from being lost to being found. And then somehow you start to slip in some kind of pride about how lost you were before you were found or something like that. Right. But this, this can happen to us really easily. Um, and just real quickly, like you see this actually in Paul's last letters in the pastoral epistles, he switches from talking about the works of the law and starts making, starts talking about like self-righteousness um, that he's uh, like second Timothy one, nine, that he saved us not because of anything we have done. He doesn't say like because of law, but you know, or in Titus three, five, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, which kind of isn't, he's not using the law language anymore. Now he's talking about like any good works you could have done. So it seems that the, the um, temptation again, to, to kind of find systems of value outside of the gospel um, comes up really, um, really quickly. And then he's just basically saying, I think, you know, that we could be struck by how similar our situation seems today to the first century. Not that, not that it got frozen in time. One of the, so I think one of the, the, the part of the new perspective on Paul that is worth opposing is the part that in some of the authors, they tend to kind of, they're trying to avoid like one set of problems. And what they end up arguing is that like all of Paul's theology is just fitting for the first century church and doesn't, isn't really relevant to us anymore. They, they put it so much in a historical setting that it has nothing to say to us today. And that's, that's one of those elements when you have to go like, yeah, I don't think we, definitely right doesn't do that, and done doesn't do that either. Okay, um, I threw this in the last minute. I've been reading this really interesting book by Fleming Rutledge called The Crucifixion. Um, and I think this um, gets to this a little bit too. And she says, the Christian gospel, when proclaimed in its radical New Testament form, is more truly inclusive of every human being, spiritually proficient or not, than any of the world's religious systems have ever been, precisely because of the, which this is one of her themes, she calls it the godlessness of Jesus's death. She says that the crucifixion is the least religious thing that ever happened in human history. Um, in fact, the word of the cross is far more sweeping in its nullification of distinctions than many by the book conservative Christians are willing to admit. The Christian gospel and slicing away all distinctions between godly and ungodly, spiritual and unspiritual, offers a vision of God's purpose for the whole human race, believers and unbelievers alike, so comprehensive and staggering that even the Apostle Paul is reduced to temporary speechlessness. Um, and that the question of, I think one of the things that, um, when we get to the, the hard question of what about those who've never heard, or why is it that, um, uh, why is there an exclusivity in the gospel? 
what that should push us back to is, is really going, no, 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 but like, we're the only people offering to the entire world a gospel that's really accessible to everyone. We think it translates into every culture. We think that um, it's appropriate to every single culture. You don't have to obey my culture if you embrace the gospel. Uh, we don't think you have to be spiritually proficient. You don't have to like, be like somebody who has the time and the money to go around looking for a guru to get Christianity, to get the gospel. Because most religious systems in the world are actually quite elitist at the end of the day. They're built for the elite. And like, have you ever talked to people about this? It's really interesting to know how like, the difference between the way, say, it's what, what happens to you if you show up as a Westerner in Nepal or something and you want to learn about Buddhism and they're all like, bring you into the temple and they kind of teach you all this stuff versus what it's like for the average poor person in those countries, what kind of access they have to, say, enlightenment, there's this huge, huge chasm. So the Beatles went and got trained by the guru and came back and went, this is the best stuff ever, right? Whereas like the access of a poor person in India to a lot of those same gurus is basically zero. So, yeah. All right, so let's, uh, how does this relate to us today then in Croatia? Um, so Croatia is a small country with an intense, varied religious identity and a turbulent recent history. Sounds a little bit like Israel in the first century. Um, legalism, pride, nationalism are all connected. Um, yeah. So, and I think that means we should uh, uh, continue to emphasize and not lose track of the power of the individual proclamation of the gospel um, that, that we have all, you know, that's such a deep part of our legacy. But I know what we're struggling with is kind of like, well, what kind of communities does this form? What kind of implications does this have for society? Um, and also think about that. And that is what the new perspective on Paul, that's, I think the best part of the new perspective on Paul was pushing us to not just look at Galatians as a story of individual salvation, but to think like really hard about why, why was Paul so worried about what was going to happen to the communities that he formed if they also adopted Jewish practices. Um, Okay, this is, this is maybe going to be tricky and a little bit controversial. I don't know. So, and then trying to figure out, okay, so how does this then impinge on or interact with Roman Catholic practice and thought? Um, this is uh, something I tried to write uh, based on, you know, reading some sources and stuff. Okay. The, there are movements in from what we would consider to be the original New Testament kind of way of, of articulating the gospel and forming communities around the gospel and the way Roman Catholic life and practice works. And, I, and these movements would be, include the following. That the, the start is the, in the New Testament, there's this radically disruptive nature of the ministry, death, and resurrection of Christ. That Christ comes, as, almost every single, th single thing he does is shocking and shocking to the most religious people. Right. Two, in Roman Catholic uh, life, there is continuity with tradition, reason, and human structures. Um, Karl Barth, the most heavy hitter Protestant theologian of the 20th century, had a long series of discussions with a prominent uh, Jesuit theologian, and they were discussing, like, what do we really, really disagree about between the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church? And they, what they, they agreed that their disagreement was on what they called the principle of reason versus the principle of faith that the Catholic Church employs the principle of reason, that everything should reasonably be in continuity with the past. So it's reasonable to pull in, like the, the, the way that the Roman church is governed has a lot of legacy from the Roman empire system, but that's reasonable because it worked. And, the, and there's an awful lot of reliance upon Greek philosophy, but that's reasonable because Greek philosophy was the best philosophy ever, ever written. So there's a, a, a heavy emphasis on continuity and reason, whereas Bart, if you know anything about Bart, Bart's all about the principle of faith, which is that it's this shocking message, nobody got it, you can't understand it unless you preach it, all this kind of stuff, it's, it's completely um, uh, unanticipated. So that would be the one kind of, yeah, no continuity, yeah. Another one would be a movement from the once and for all nature of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ that you see emphasized really heavily like in Hebrews, like there was a system, but now Jesus came and died and was resurrected once. And so now it's like this, to um, continual reenactment of the death of Christ through time. So when you, when you look into what the sacramental system really means, it's, it's a bloodless re-sacrifice of Christ in the mass that um, uh, uh, you know, is a continued uh, re-representation of this, 
of the death of Christ through time. From Christ as the only personal mediator of our faith to the human reality of the Roman church's institutional mediator. I think maybe this is the single biggest disagreement is that um, the, this comes from you know, the, the verses about saying that the, Jesus is going to give the keys to the apostles. And so it's like the, all, the treasury of riches that Christ won on the cross has been completely entrusted to the human institution physically you know, locatable in the Roman church. Uh, so then grace happens not as Christ as mediator, but basically the church is the mediator of grace to you because Christ has won all of those things at the cross. So there's agreement kind of like what happens there, but then there's this statement that then, that then it's all given over to the church. And so the church becomes the mediator. And so as a result, I think grace goes from a particular scandalous one time incongruous gift accounted to our benefit in Christ to a universal, rational, measured, and increasingly fitting gift uh, that gets infused into us through the concrete presence of the Roman Catholic Church, especially through sacramental relationship to the church. And that that would be a way, so in, in other words, like fighting about whether works have anything to do with our faith or what place works plays in our faith is all kind of downstream or um, subsequent to figuring this part of it out. That I think what happened, like if I were to get, like this is me kind of speculating, but that when you look at sort of when, the, when Luther publishes his theses and he says, it's not like this, uh, uh, God, it's just by faith alone. And the Roman structures of the Roman church were looking at this and trying to figure out how to respond to it. They didn't reject it because they were just so concerned necessarily about um, that this is a wanton, the license to sin or something. They, what they rejected was the idea that this puts the intermediary role of the church itself out of business. And that that's what is, is absolutely kind of core to, if, 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 you're, if you look at all sorts of different theological issues of what the Roman Catholic Church can accept and not accept, I think you'll, you find, I found it very clarifying to ask, does accepting this or not accepting this like affirm the continued role, mediating role of the physical presence of the Roman Catholic Church in the midst of all this, or does it threaten it? And, and when you see which way that pushes, you'll see why the decision gets made the way it does. So that's kind of the way I'm thinking about that. Um, Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, go ahead. On that chart, would you say that that's primarily a theological issue in terms of, of church leadership, or would you say that that's something that the average Catholic... Oh, yes, thank you. But, yeah, no, I don't think the average... Catholic probably has really much, but it's the difference between sort of explicit and implicit knowledge, like explicitly, no way. And I, you know, I've been learning that this is kind of the way it is like just recently. I mean, I've just been thinking about this or I mean, reading some about it, but, but when you feel implicitly, why does somebody intuitively go, that can't be right. When, when we say something about grace or the way the gospel works and they're like, no, 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 no. The it church, the, no. it doesn't fit. The church is there between us and God. Uh, and there's no grace outside of church. Yeah. Right? But because of sacraments and yes. yeah. grace continuity, yeah. otherwise they're obsolete. Yeah. 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 Maybe there is just a bomb in the middle of it, but do you not see this like in the Protestant church? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. pastor is officially an apostle. Yeah. Some yeah. yeah. And then Oof. you're excommunicated. Uh-huh. Right? Sorry. <laughs> Not that anyone's ever experienced that. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. This this the the question I mean, I think the question that that a lot of um uh, Okay, I'll really get myself in trouble now. You know how like Tito wore a white uniform? Whoa. Yes. Right? Franjo Tujman. <laughs> no, 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 let me finish. No, I'm gonna. I'm going two. Pla I'm going. I'm going two places. So everyone will be mad. What kind of uniform did Franja Tujman wear? Off white. Well, yeah. 
So there's this thing where when you hate something desperately and you want to be ev- as different from it as you can, but it's what formed you, when you try to throw it all off, you end up recreating it unintentionally. You know, so the Croatia wanted so much to not be like Yugoslavia, right? But then like the way... Like, I think the way Branitelli function inside of Croatia is an awful lot like the way Partizan uh, veterans functioned inside of Yugoslavia because, because you're like, we want to be so different, but we're just going to... But you, you just end up replacing things and putting them into the same categories instead of changing the categories because changing your categories is really hard. Changing your mental map of how things work is really hard. So I do think a lot of... Protestant churches in Croatia that have a very negative view towards the Catholic Church, without understanding it, recreate so many of the similar structures themselves. Except Franja Tujman really loved Tito. That's true. Tujman is a complicated man. Okay. Um, Multi layered. Okay, so, and uh, also, I'm, I don't want to do this for, for purposes of. Um, like making fun or anything, but just to show, we're, we're, we're at the end here, but just to show you some of the ways that I think that having these categories helps us in reading documents that we might otherwise really scratch our heads about. So here are three lines from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And I think now knowing how to distinguish between priority and incongruity, uh, uh, and also, um, uh, maybe even uh, efficacy, helps us to kind of read these and kind of see more what's going on. So in the beginning of the discussion about grace, in the, in the catechism, it says, grace is favor, the free and undeserved help that God gives to help us respond to his call to become children of God. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's the first line. Then 10 lines, 10, you know, entries later, it says filial adoption, adoption of sons, in making us partakers by grace in the divine nature can bestow true merit on us as a result of God's gratuitous justice. That's, uh, yeah, I probably should have, because that's all in creation as well. I should have gotten both. Bestow means to actually like, to, like a king gives you something, it puts it on you. And it's true merit, and it's now kind of ours as a result of this uh, kind of almost unseemly. So they'll talk about that, too. They'll talk about this almost like scandalous uh, justice of God. Um, But this is our right by grace, the full right of love, making us co-heirs with Christ and worthy of obtaining the promised inheritance of eternal life. That one's more like kind of for me, like the first one, I'm like, I agree, more like I agree. The second one's like, hmm, something's going on here. And the third one, I think it, it then... That's where you see the legacy of uh, the um, Council of Trent. Uh, Moved by the Holy Spirit and by charity, we can then merit for ourselves and for others the grace is needed for our sanctification, for the increase of grace and charity, and for the attainment of eternal life. So that's that's where it finally, the congruity comes back in. Um, and, and again, I'm not, I don't do this to, to, to make fun, but, but, but again, like I, would, I, I read these every once in a while and think, what exactly is going on here? And I think, again, the, the aspects of grace, the perfections of grace help me understand better, like, what is being done here? So um, these are, you know, the, the, all the, uh, the quotes from edu- the visions have dates on them, right? So um, here's one. I won't do all of them. When you are far from God... You cannot receive graces because you do not seek them with a firm faith. Day by day, I am praying for you, and I want to draw you ever more near to God, but I can't if you don't want it. Can you just clarify what Medjugorje oh, yeah. So Medjugorje is one of the, I think right now it is one of the only places in the world, or the only place in the world, where there are continuing ongoing visions that are received from Mary. And it's right across the border into Bosnia from Croatia, but in the part of Bosnia where Croatians are very, are in the majority. Um, so it's like Lourdes or Fatima, but it is kind of, Lourdes and Fatima happened like a long, you know, a long time ago, and the visionaries who were receiving visions, I think have all passed away. And where in Medjugorje, it's still, it's still so, kind of ongoing. And so many, many American Catholics will come and visit. And yeah. interestingly enough, uh, 
the official Vatican, the Pope, they do not officially recognize the... Uh, right. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> so this is... Yeah, but, but uh, I think it receives maybe 2 million visitors a year, so people from all over the world go there, and it's very influential in, in uh, lived Catholic experience today in Croatia. So when it says I, it's Mary. Yeah, sorry, that's Mary speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, like the third one, she says, you know, you are a... You are chosen people, and God has given you great graces. You are not conscious of every message I am giving you. Now I just want to say, pray, pray, pray. I don't know what else to tell you, because I love you, and I want you to comprehend my love and God's love through prayer. Thank you for having responded to my call. Um, so I think there's a, an issue interesting with that efficacy question of like how how efficacious is God's grace? Does it accomplish what it's set out to do? Because there's a there's a note here of a kind of desperation of kind of like you're, you're not getting it. You're, you're supposed to get it. You're, you're, you're resisting this uh, in a way that it's itself kind of, you know, interesting. It's interesting that grace says, it's, it's in plural, so it's not, you know, yep. you're not receiving grace, but grace says. Yeah, there's a lot of language in Medjugorje about how this is, this is a special grace from God that this is even happening. And so I think like that's why the, the one in creation down there. So this is the time of grace which God gives um, by my presence, but you are far from my heart. So I call on you to personal repentance and, and family prayer. Like, so the, like grace is represented in the fact that these visions are happening. Uh, so this is a special time of grace that, that won't last forever, um, but you are far from it. Again, I bring that up more, more to think about, like, that it, it helps you to, you know, when you think about what is really being emphasized here, is it, is it abundance, is it priority, and kind of what, what's going on, it can help you to, to think about even how to respond to it. Okay, kind of at the end, what I would um, suggest that is a really, really good story to capture this in our evangelism would be the story of the prodigal son. So we know the story, right? The, the, the younger son's a jerk. He dishonors his father. He asks for half the inheritance. He goes away. He blows all the money. <laughs> He's, uh, we, you know, and we're very familiar often. To, and so I, I, I know that through Henry Now and through different things, most of us are familiar with this, of kind of the scandalous nature of the way that he says, okay, I have a plan. I'm going to go home. I'm going to repent. I'm going to ask my father to make me like one of his hired servants. That's my action plan, right? And he gets back, and then several shocking things happen. His father is looking him from, at him from far away. His father runs to him. Uh, his father refuses to hear the speech. He never gets to give his little repentance speech. So he receives incongruous grace from his father, absolutely not in accordance with who he is and what he has done, right? Uh, and, then, and then the father goes overboard, and there's this superabundance of the fact that he says, kill the fatted calf, we're going to have a party, because my son who was lost is found. Okay, but who is that parable truly aimed at? The older son. It's aimed at the Pharisees. And so then we get the older son. And the older son, in his own less dramatic way, also dishonors his father. He refuses to come into the party. So the father who has been dishonored by a son who went away and blew a bunch of money is now basically dishonored by having to go outside of the party to go kind of try to win over the older son. And the older son is, you know, pouty and angry. I work like crazy for you. You never let me have a party with my friends. I hate you, <laughs> like in as much as saying, like, I am completely resentful of you and your mercy and your grace. And the crazy thing with the parable is that it ends without resolution, yeah. right? The, the father says these beautiful wonder, everything I have, I give, yours. is yours. yours. There's like three statements. Yeah. I should have. Yeah. We had to rejoice yeah, yeah. And, and, and then it just stops. And it's like Jesus is telling this parable primarily. I mean, the, 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 what he's really addressing is the, the older sons, the Pharisees, saying to them, like, can you handle the way my grace actually works? Because you are also broken. And my grace is also incongruous to you in the same way it is to the younger son. So I think it's a really good place for us to, you know, because people like the Bible story. I mean, people like the parables and they like Jesus's, you know, stories and stuff to discuss the parable of the prodigal son. 
explanation of the gospel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it leaves you, as a, yeah, it as leaves you like, like, yeah. You know, this is, so that would be a good one. I think that's a good one for us to discuss with people and say, not which one do you identify more with, but which, which heart attitude is easier for you to, you know, which one are you more sympathetic with, the younger son or the older son? And most people are probably going to say, well, the older son, that kind of, it kind of doesn't feel right, right? But then, and then you can help explain some of these cultural things, say, see how the younger son shamed his father, but see how the older son is also basically doing the same thing. And that, and that you're left with this, you're left in the story unresolved. And the unresolution is supposed to point you towards saying, like, you have to figure out whether you can accept that this is the way God's grace actually really works. I think, so I think that ties it together nicely. So I went a little bit long. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you very, very much for your attention and for engaging and everything.